Hello and welcome to Father Spitzer's Universe, where no man has gone before. We go there every week, though, and we bring you with us. I'm Doug Keck, your host, coming to you live from our EWTN studios in the heart of the mothership, Irondale, Alabama, Mother Angelica Way, where it all began back in 1981 and continues thanks to your donations and support. We need your support for this show, too, so check us out on Facebook. Send us a tweet on Twitter. And for all things Father Spitzer, two places to go now. There's the, of course, Magis Center website. That's magiscenteroneword.com. And, of course, remember Father's newest website, which is the basis of the series we're doing right now, Credible Catholic One Word. Dot com, And we want you to know that everything about Catholicism is totally credible. Today we're talking about near-death experiences part two. Uh, always a very interesting topic. And I wanted to mention also we're very proud here about a film that we produce called Called and Chosen. It's the Father Vincent R. Capadano story. That's what it's about. It's a Gabriel Award winner. And we decided to re-air it, popular demand, on July 4th, a perfect time to air, 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Eastern Time. If you missed it, watch it. It's a great story about a wonderful Catholic chaplain, and it's an award-winning film. And speaking of award winners, we turn once more to the West Coast with the one and only Father Robert Spitzer at our beautiful studios in Orange County, California, on the campus of Christ <laughs> Cathedral as well. And welcome, Father. Great to see you again. Great to be back with you, Doug. So as we're going to be talking about near-death experiences, but if we could, let's start off, as we always do, with a prayer from you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us to inspire us and guide us and protect us this day so that uh, we might truly understand the wonderful life you have prepared for us throughout all eternity with you, a life of love, a life of joy, a life of holiness, a life of salvation, together with all the blessed and especially in your triune love. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Very good. And so let's get started and let's uh, deal with some questions that came out of uh, our recent programs, including the one from last week. Uh, dear sure. Father Spitzer, last week you said that God does not send us to hell, but rather we choose hell. I'm very disturbed by this comment. To me, it seems to contradict both the Catechism and the Bible, Matthew 13, where God's angels will weed the earth of the unfaithful. If we send ourselves to hell, then what's the point of Judgment Day? Thank you. It's Dan from Illinois. Hmm. Uh, no, it's a really good question, Dan. And, uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, judgment does entail, uh, you know, a, a, a rendering of what we have lived our lives and how we have lived our lives and the choice that we have made throughout our lives uh, to uh, uh, go the way of the Lord or to go the way of, of uh, uh, perdition. And so, in, in a way, uh, judgment is a reflection of of the choices we have made and the choice that we have back to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, obviously God in that judgment can be uh, incredibly merciful, um, especially if we have asked for that mercy and that compassion uh, in our lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, yes, there is a, certainly a factor of that, but it, it is really about our free choices. That's what it's about. Uh, God is, you know, uh, yes, uh, you know, you can say that um, God, you know, instrumentally uh, allows us to go where we have actually chosen uh, throughout our lives to go, no mm -hmm. question about that. Uh, and so he would have a, a ascending dimension in, in that sense. Uh, you know, when you're um, uh, looking at the catechism, uh, which you, you brought up, uh, the main thing you want to remember ever and always is that uh, there is that word self-exclusion hmm. from the blessed and from God. And, and the idea of self-exclusion, the reason uh, that the, the church defines hell in that way is because it is really 
our choice. Our, we are the ones mm -hmm. who are excluding ourselves mm -hmm. from the kingdom of heaven. And, and in a way, it, it gets that, that uh, uh, sense, you know, that's why Jesus is so, so, you know, uh, emphasizing uh, with, with real rhetoric of urgency that, you know, we kind of get our act together, that mm -hmm. we try to, uh, you, know, m you know, manifest our desire to serve the Lord in our lives so that our choices really reflect right the the desire to go to his kingdom rather than the desire to exclude ourselves mm -hmm. from that kingdom and that's what the word self exclusion means mm -hmm. the the third er part of your question deals with the the Matthew passage uh you know um where Jesus is is clearly using uh that parable now you have to be really careful mm -hmm. when you're interpreting a parable in 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 kind of a, a literalistic Mm -hmm. sense, right? You, you, you don't want to be taking something which uh, obviously, you know, is used as an image to mm -hmm. convey something and, and trying to, to make it, uh, literalize it uh, into an actual thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is Jesus here trying to say that there are really angels that are sending people uh, uh, to hell? Mm -hmm. Well, to be honest with you, uh, exegetes uh, have puzzled over this, mm -hmm. you know, for an, an, an awful long time, you know, uh, whether or not this is to be taken literally or taken as 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 a metaphor uh, to indicate, you know, that you know the judgment is definitive, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, y you know, it's it's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, but if you know if it um, you know it helps to 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 think of you know angels dispatching. Um, as it were, the choices that we have made, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, then go ahead and interpret it in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you're free to do so, and, and the Catholic Church certainly doesn't say you can't. There are other interpretations which are also allowed mm -hmm. from the same passage by the Catholic Church's doctrine of self-exclusion from uh, the kingdom of God and the blessed. And so, again, you could look at it, you know, uh, in, 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 a, in the way that the angels are, you know, not just dispatching our choices, but that we dispatch our choices and they are the agents through which our own choice is dispatched. So mm -hmm. you can look at it that way mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly, uh, you know, apply it uh, uh, as you wish. Right. But, you know, the key thing to, 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 to note is be, be kind of careful about that. And, and also in the parables, right, when Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you have to be careful because that word like indicates like an analogy or, or mm -hmm. something like that or the kingdom of God may be likened to right you, you have to be very very careful you know about trying to give a, a definitive interpretation once again uh, what I would recommend if, if you want to get you know a really good sense of what what's the exegetical community thinking about this the Catholic Church has a its own commentary on scripture. It's called the Jerome Biblical mm -hmm. Commentary. It's a very good scholarly exegetical commentary. It, it really does reflect the mainstream mm -hmm. of exegetical uh, thinking on things. And that's probably where you would want to go. There's a brand new one. Well, it's not brand new anymore. I mean, there's there's two of them, but the, the one that came out in 1998 is the one you want. That's called the new mm -hmm. Jerome Biblical Commentary. And that might help you to do interpretations of these passages to get a sense of where the Catholic uh, uh, scholarly community right. uh, is, and and by the way, the most most of these people are are you know priests and, and laity in good standing mm -hmm. who are very very fine uh, scholars of, of scripture. Okay, very good. Let's move on to a second question that ties into last week as well. Last week, uh, Father Spitzer, you discussed. Mm -hmm reasons that most adults who flatline don't have a near-death experience. I've heard that one is often given a choice to stay or go. Given that God is omniscient, could it be that he usually wants us to go back knowing we likely choose to stay? Perhaps children would more likely choose to go back to alleviate their families, uh, I guess to, in the sense of, of, uh, of not wanting their families mm -hmm. to suffer. God bless, this mm -hmm. is from Mary. 
Yeah, Mary, uh, that's a great question. Here, here's the, the main thing. Um, children oftentimes, uh, well, not oftentimes, children sometimes are given a choice, um, you know, whether they want to go back or not. But normally, after their meeting, um, you know, with Jesus or their meeting uh, with um, uh, sometimes the white light or with a deceased relative, right? After that meeting, they're kind of told, you know, well, it's not your time yet, you know, and, and it's time you're going to have to go back for a while and, and so forth. So that's generally the case with children. Rarely uh, is there a choice involved. F much more frequently, adults um, are given a choice, uh, and, and, um, mm -hmm. and that happens... Uh, you know, m maybe about 20% of the time, uh, you know, um, you know, there's a, a relative or a mm -hmm. friend or even, uh, you know, this, this uh, very loving white light mm -hmm. will, will basically give a choice of whether or not to go back. Mm -hmm. uh, the vast majority, obviously, everyone that we know right. that was offered Decided this to come choice, back, right? Came, Otherwise, we wouldn't, wouldn't know, back. right? Otherwise, we, we wouldn't know, know. Right. exactly. Right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. So, right. uh, <laughs> we do know that that's about 20% of the people are given that, uh, of the adults are given that choice. Much fewer percentage, of, much lower percentage of children. Mm -hmm. But in any case, yeah, it just seems like that choice is there. But the majority of the time, uh, you know, the decision is kind of made already. Mm -hmm. Most adults, of course, you know, I would suppose who have family members, mm -hmm. etc., uh, you know, who they're worried about will come back. Uh, they don't want to leave things undone, and that's mm -hmm. out of a sense of love, and uh, they're given that choice. So um, um, that, that's pretty much the answer there. And I'm assuming we, we really wouldn't know, but it, is there any reason why we would suspect some people have that experience and some people don't? Is it possible that some people might have that experience but don't remember that experience? Oh, that, that's possible too. Mm. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, really it's up to God's wisdom and, and judgment. And, and at this particular point, uh, I don't know why he, yeah, I can't get into God's mind and I mm -hmm. couldn't tell you why he would do that. But I know one thing that the relatives, the deceased relatives and friends who come to meet these individuals mm -hmm. and frequently, you know, give them that choice. Right. Uh, or even if it's the white light, it, it, you know, himself who gives the choice, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, these relatives are, are really doing the will of God. They're presenting uh, somehow the judgment of God mm -hmm. for sure. And so, you know, um, and why some people are not, you know, why this right. other 80% doesn't even remember, you know, the choice, it, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Okay. And, uh, but, but clearly, right, um, they, they, they are sometimes given a choice. Okay, here's another question in the same vein. Dear Father Spitzer, uh, can we actually meet the people we love in heaven after we die, assuming that we get to heaven? Please answer, God bless you always with love from Ursula from merry old England. Thank you, Ursula. Ah, uh, Ursula from merry old England, great question. And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we're, we know this from, you know, from the fact if, 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 you know, our relatives are in heaven and we're going to heaven, we are definitely going to be allowed to, to meet those relatives in heaven and be with them. Heaven, you know, is that community, mm -hmm. right, of, of people, right, uh, in love through the Trinity. Uh, and, and of course, why in the world would the Lord ever deprive us of, of the capacity to connect with uh, our uh, loved ones, mm -hmm. our beloved ones, in that state of perfect communal love with the blessed? Absolutely, you're going to be able to see your deceased relatives and friends in heaven. And by the way, that's validated in the kind of experiences uh, we were just talking about in answer to right. the last question. And a lot of the time, deceased relatives and friends will come to meet person. Strangely enough, though, um, uh, a lot of the time, some, uh, the relatives are either unknown or mm -hmm. were not the relatives that people expected to see. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, okay, Aunt so-and-so was a nice person, and uh, I thought I'd see so-and-so, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm seeing this person. But you can't make any 
any judgment about why that occurs. That's again God's will. He dispatches, right, uh, the person who will greet uh, people frequently. And um, uh, we don't know why it's those particular relatives. It, but we do know this, about 95% of the time it is relatives. Only 5% of the time it's friends. Right. So um, interestingly, um, you know, uh, it's, it's really relatives. Do you think but, that's boy, uh, very unpredictable? Is that because you th that that connection that uh, that their the family connection is so strong, even over and above maybe a friend connection? Yeah, that's what I think. Right. I just think blood is just thicker than anything, right. you know. And I do think those family connections, even if it's a, right. an aunt to me, have died even before the child got, you know. Uh, you know, to heaven, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, that right. blood relationship somehow is, right. is, is strong uh, from the side of the aunt who may have been deceased. And, right. and uh, so uh, that's the one sent. And, right. you know, I always say, why did I get the guardian angel I got? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, but I, I'm sure it was, as they say, right for me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and God is the best judge of that. But um, yeah. boy, it's, uh, yes, you will meet your relatives. There's like, right. Just like your cross is the one that was designed for you, right? Exactly. So, exactly. and it kind of fits into the whole teaching for the church of the whole communion of saints and the fact of our ability to pray to people in heaven and the saints uh, that they are alive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, a absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I mean, there, you know, God has his... Uh, uh, orchestrates all these things perfectly, but I, I do know this. I mean, when he talks about the heavenly banquet, he mm -hmm. means that you know. I mean, we're going to be seated with all these people, including all of our deceased relatives and friends. I, I think I talked mm -hmm. about uh, on the show once before. You know, I had a dream once. You know, where, uh, I, you know, it was um, like I was. Um, I had a, a thousand hands almost. And um, all the people that I had somehow touched in my life, you know, um, in this dream, mm -hmm. it was like these hands were coming out of me mm -hmm. and they were touching all these people who I had touched who in turn were touching these other people who they had touched and so forth. And it kind of turned into this huge Irish lace of, of uh, people touching people, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, hands, you know, all the way, you know, extended out for all this sort of, you know, a huge uh, dimension mm -hmm. and I sort of woke up from that and went well I guess in a way that's heaven right. um, so uh, yeah I, I think that, that that's absolutely the right. truth I think we get uh, that communion of saints is of right. course uh, you know the, the, you know particularly the people right. we've touched but also we'll get to see all these other people mm -hmm. and we have an a, eternity right. to enjoy them perfectly along with the infinite right. love of the Trinity and like you said, we might find out that uh, Green Ann Edna is the one who's been praying you into heaven. Exactly. Exactly. She might be showing up there, and you're not the one <laughs> exactly. you expect, right? So. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Exactly. Here's another question that dovetails into uh, what you were just talking about, uh, talking about dreams. My non-Catholic daughter-in-law has had dreams of dead people who she knew. I suggested to her that these people may be in purgatory and requesting prayers for their soul. Was I correct in suggesting this? I'm not even sure if she believes in purgatory, and this is from Dick. Yeah, uh, Dick, I think, again, a good question. I think that uh, it's absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. I think when I, uh, sometimes I get a, a premonition, you know, or I'll wake up in the, at, at night or something, and I will rem see some guy as vividly as, as as if I was with him 20 years ago and I haven't had any contact with him or suddenly a name will pop into my mind mm -hmm. and you know I don't even know where they are they could be living they might be deceased I don't even know some of them are in fact deceased but the the one thing I, I do when I get that pop in mm -hmm. of, of a person or a name pops into my mind mm -hmm. I do pray for them and I do pray pray for their salvation and I pray especially that if they're in some kind of trouble or difficulty mm -hmm. or challenge then I you know double up the prayers and uh, you know offer my own you know prayers works joys and sufferings for them so uh, yes I, I do I think it's a great piece of advice and uh, do it myself mm -hmm. okay 
Again, Father, here's another question uh, in the same vein. Okay. What do you think about internet postings of people claiming to go to hell and come back? My personal opinion is, is that it's possible that these people are experiencing purgatory. What do you think, Joanne? So do we have any records of well, people experiencing hell and coming back? Well, Joanne, I, I think that what they might be experiencing, and there are these negative near-death experiences, there's, there's no doubt about it, uh, they're much rarer than the, uh, the beautiful ones, but um, they are there. And, you know, the way I would look at it is it's kind of a, like a, a, an image, you know, almost like a, a pre-image. They, they, they think they're going to, to hell, but they're really kind of experiencing in, in some sense what hell would be like. Mm -hmm. They're almost on the periphery of hell, mm -hmm. if I can put it that way, and they all of a sudden get this experience of, this is highly unpleasant. Time to get my act together. Time to turn around and, and, and start pursuing uh, another kind of life. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, um, uh, it's, it's really, I would look at it as more, you know, the periphery of hell, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you, you might remember, you know, uh, um, you know, Virgil, mm -hmm. um, you know, in Dante's uh, Inferno, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as, as, uh, as, you know, um, you know the, the encounter, you know, with the, the guide Virgil at the gate, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, you get this little uh, pretaste, if I right. can put it that way, at the periphery. And you go, hmm, mm -hmm. not so sure. I like this. I right. think I better get my act together. So right. I think it's really a call uh, to reform more than purgatory. Right. Uh, yes, purgatory can definitely have its, uh, you know, a painful dimension, right? Because right. it is purgation. We do have to give up something that we're attached to. You know, we, we, we've left this earth not ha having freely detached from things, but, but by we, we've left this earth, mm -hmm. you know, freely desiring to be with God for the rest of our lives, definitively. Mm -hmm. And so we've got some work to do, and those detachments, mm -hmm. um, they, they come hard. I mean, I can tell you right now, detaching myself from, mm -hmm. from uh, my attachments is, is uh, right. very, very difficult indeed. I don't like doing it. Uh, and so, um, frankly, uh, I, I, I tend to not to like the cross in, in most of its forms, but I, I, I know that the Lord uses that cross to really uh, affect me in a, in a very good purgative way. Okay. And, and in that sense, it's, right. it's good. Right, so we're, we're striving to be better than the noble pagans, at least in, yeah. in that yep, sense. Exactly. But let me ask you a question, too, because uh, sure. there's a question coming up about uh, Protestants uh, and does it affect maybe if they have a near-death experience, uh, think about uh, becoming Catholic mm -hmm. or something like that. But a broader question to say, has there been a longitudinal study done on people with near-death experiences indicating whether these people necessarily, let's say they had this hell-like experience, that they really changed their lives or the people who had the uh, heaven-like experience really altered their lives or we could see it had an impact on their lives? Or has it, there have been any studies on that? Yeah, I think this um, person, Dr. Janice Atchison, I think is what her name is, and I, mm -hmm. I might be wrong, but I think that, uh, that she tried to do some follow-up work mm -hmm. on that. Um, I have to say, though, that the vast majority of the good peer-reviewed medical studies of near-death experiences, mm -hmm. like the Van Lommel study or the Parnia study, mm -hmm. those studies uh, really emphasize the experience themselves, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and validating, you know, the, what, what the patients are reporting okay. and cataloging what the patients are reporting. Uh, not a lot of longitudinal study has been done. However, they do have um, uh, some longitudinal data mm -hmm. on when children have had a near-death experience, uh, several um, uh, scientists have tried to measure uh, does their death anxiety progress into their, I mean, their, mm -hmm. their absence of death anxiety right. um, progress into their adulthood. They have done that, and that very much is the case. Okay. They, uh, they don't have any subconscious mm 
mm-hmm. death anxiety anymore. Okay. So it never comes back, okay. um, which is really strange because mm-hmm. when you think about it, right, I mean, how do you change a subconscious response? Answer, mm-hmm. you can't voluntarily, that is consciously, change a subconscious reaction to something like death, right? Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, we have a normal death anxiety. And so if you are to measure the subconscious death anxiety by showing images like death symbols and things like that, say in ink blots or whatever it might be, and you show that to a person, right, they are going to feel a death anxiety, mm-hmm. whether they're deeply religious or not. Mm-hmm. Now, can you say, would a deeply religious person have a conscious uh, you know, worry, maybe a lot less than a non-religious person. Mm-hmm. But that's a conscious worry. A subconscious worry is very difficult to change because, of course, it is really subterranean in there and it's exceedingly symbolic. But mm-hmm. I can connect with your subconscious through symbols, through ink blots and things like that. And I can sort of show you death images. Mm-hmm. And really, if you're religious or you're non-religious, you're still going to have what we call, you know, you're going to r- probably score mm-hmm. within, you know, the, the, the range of death anxiety is modified by, you know, a, 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 I mean, is measured by a modified polygraph. So so you're going to see that. Now, what's interesting about near-death experiences is once a person has had that, their subconscious response changes. Mm-hmm. It literally changes their whole subconscious view. Their okay. whole image of death changes. You can show a child a gazillion death images and there's no response. And of course, there's, there's like no anxiety about it. And of course, as, the, as they progress into their adulthood, it never returns. Mm-hmm. So that is some longitudinal data. It's really interesting. And it validates that there's something exceedingly real that mm-hmm. is going on in this. Um, you know, it's not just the reports uh, of accurate data that's taking place in the operating room or outside the hospital. It's, and it's not just the reports of blind people mm-hmm. who have been blind from birth suddenly seeing for the first time when they're clinically dead. Right. But it really is, I think, these longitudinal studies of, of death anxieties, uh, death anxiety. And so I think, uh, again, th- some of that's been done, right. but not a lot of follow-up work and certainly not okay. in peer-reviewed medical studies. Okay, so we were uh, kind of alluded to the next question that had to do with uh, mm-hmm. Protestants. Uh, again, do Protestants typically see anything that would incline them to be Catholics when they return from a near-death experience? How are we to reconcile near-death experience with God's immediate judgment after death, which you kind of touched on earlier? That was Tim from yeah. Sarasota. There's also a follow-up to that. There's another question. I don't okay. know if we have it ready to come up, which has to do... Uh, aren't there near-death experiences that uh, happen to non-Christians like Buddhist experiences? If so, how are we to view those experiences? Thanks for your wisdom and ministry. And are those experiences what they see different? Uh, Yeah, I mean, some of the images in the Buddhist experience, uh, well, first of all, yes, there have been catalogs of those, uh, let's say, um, uh, near-death experiences of Buddhists, yes. The images initially are different. Mm -hmm. Uh, What is the same is, of course, congruent with uh, uh, Jesus Christ's teaching in the scripture, Mm -hmm. namely the love that is intrinsic to that experience. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, uh, like the experience of the white light, the experience of love, of intrinsic to the white light mm-hmm. is very much uh, the same. Uh, similarly, you know, there are other kinds of things that happen before they go to that other domain. But yes, sometimes uh, the, the images that they get up front mm-hmm. uh, correspond uh, to the images that, that are part of their own religion. Okay. So um, I forget again that, that there was a researcher who did uh, some, you know, mm-hmm. uh, studies across the board in religions. Um, and but there are a lot of similarities but some of the images that they will see up front uh, are the same but when they meet deceased relatives and friends or they Mm -hmm. see the white light they're of course the the whole experience is dominated by love Mm -hmm. Uh, do they see beauty yes they see beauty and and of course um, uh, you know uh, uh, I'm not sure whether there have been any um, uh, studies 
uh, that have been negative with respect to Buddhists. And I'm sure there have been, mm -hmm. um, or you know, with other religions. Right. Um, but uh, I'm just not aware of them. I, I know there are some handbooks of right. near-death experiences that go into some of this, um, uh, these areas. But again, be right. careful with those because a lot of those things are you know anecdotal that mm -hmm. means they're like one-off stories mm -hmm. and you have to be a little careful with those what you really want to do is get real studies mm -hmm. that have thousands of patients that have been interviewed that where you have double blind studies or you have validation of data that took place uh, you know uh, while they were clinically dead you know what they're reporting happened in the operating room etc you have validation that this really did in fact uh, occur as they've reported it and then you know you have a you know a, a, a some kind of a scale a, a large scale uh, measurement of mm -hmm. these uh, occurrences over a, a fairly good period okay. of time like about six seven years that would be the kind of study you want be very very careful about hearing one-off stories right. because those things could be just downright false uh, they could be very manipulative. They mm -hmm. could be uh, trying to play to an agenda or something of that nature. You really right. need exactly. a good social science. Especially uh, if you're reading place. them on the internet, be careful. Okay, we're going to take a oh, break. Oh, yeah, absolutely. With Father absolutely. Spitzer yeah. here once more. And uh, stay with us. Father Spitzer's Universe continues. We're going to be talking all about things that happen with near death experiences. And uh, there's a lot of interesting things to hear about so stay with us right here in the heart of father spitzer's universe where we learn something new each week stay with us found us. We're still here in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe. Happy to have you joining us as we talk about near-death experiences, part two, part of a CredibleCatholic.com review. And once more, we join Father Spitzer as always. We've been talking about uh, near-death experiences and questions that people have sent to us. Let me ask you one question that might uh, somebody out there might be thinking about. They're thinking, well, sure. okay, so you have this near-death experience, and as Christians, we would think certainly uh, Jesus Christ is, is God and our Savior, and mm -hmm. so wouldn't someone who maybe wasn't Christian be encouraged by the light or in their experience to become Christian? And if they're not, do we have any idea why they wouldn't be? Yeah, here is the difficulty with, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, near-death experiences. What you get is a really small glimpse mm -hmm. of what you might call that peripheral experience, that experience of, you know, paradise or that experience of being with the white light, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I could reconfigure your question is into something like this. Well, why wouldn't the white light just say, well, mm -hmm. uh, I'm the father of Jesus Christ or I'm Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Christians mm -hmm. say, I know the white light is Jesus, right? right? And, and they, they just say, I know it, uh, you know, it is the, it is the case. When kids um, uh, see Jesus, of course, it's, it's a different deal. Mm -hmm. um, they really see a, a, a Jesus that looks like you know, the Jesus that that one uh, little girl made that drawing of, mm -hmm. kids almost universally agree, that's him. Mm -hmm. You know, they sh they're shown 28 different pictures of Jesus, you know, from the, uh, you know, the whole history of the Sacred Heart uh, pictures. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, what do they pick? They pick the one by this little girl uh, who just happened to have a, you know, be an artistic talent, but, you know, saw Jesus and, and really was able to put it down and describe it to a very good artist. And she had it sort of t fine tuned to perfection and kids all always choose it. Mm -hmm. But what my point is, is you, you get a peripheral view and, and you, you might think, well, here's the Lord's opportunity to get these people, you know, maybe to, to, to consider, you know, that I am Jesus Christ, you know, almost a Pauline experience. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't done any major, major studies of this mm -hmm. or whether such things have happened uh, before, but whatever seems to occur, 
it, it, it seems not to interfere with the free choice of the people there. Oh, okay. And as far as we can see, mm -hmm. the, the, the key thing that's going on, you know, is that there's some kind of reassurance, you know, uh, from the white light or some reassurance uh, from uh, God or even what you might call Jesus uh, as the white light that what they're doing is okay you know they're they're okay and th there seems to be a deliberate attempt not to you know upend their freedom or their free choices uh, in in some form of continuity now you might say well well, why not? Why not just get them, uh, you know, uh, moving toward Christianity mm -hmm. right away? Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I don't know the answer to that uh, for two reasons. Number one, we really don't have a good social, social scientific study of that phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard when you have about two or three anecdotal accounts. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to draw any conclusive judgment from that. And I would refrain from doing that. And the second thing is it's really hard to penetrate, you know, what's going on in the total experience of those people when they come back mm -hmm. because you, you know, there's, they remember things, they don't remember things, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. It's very difficult, plus right. they're going to put their own interpretation right, on it. Right, right. And one other item is the Lord generally doesn't do anything to upset the continuity of their free choices. And so uh, essentially, uh, you know, if you put all three of these things mm -hmm. together, there's probably an answer, uh, you know, to your mm -hmm. question. But right now, we do not have anywhere right. near right. a good study of that phenomenon. Well, it kind of maybe, right, in fact, right. uh, the Lord does say something. Right. Uh, you know, the Lord does manifest, uh, you know, um, uh, his identity as Jesus. Right. And, and we just don't know. Uh, you know, it could be like a St. Paul type of experience. Right, and, and we know from seers, uh, Fatima and Lords and things like that, though they may have been encouraged in some ways, they certainly weren't forced to do anything as well. So. That's right, that's right, right. right. So. And, and, and that's exactly right. And so, uh, you, you know, it's, it's the same thing with, uh, you know, people who, who witness a miracle, mm -hmm. you know, in the name of Jesus, you know, that's clear miracle. You know, and, and you, you look at that and you go, well, why didn't that person just instantly go, you know, like Peter, <laughs> you know, Lord, uh, you know, please, you know, I'm, I'm a sinful man. <laughs> you don't have to hang around the likes of me, right. you know. I mean, why didn't they just get on their knees, you mm -hmm. know, uh, when they see this? And, and again, God tends not to, 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 to put, to do something that's going to, uh, you know, interfere with their uh, uh, with their freedom. Free will, and boy, well, I'll yeah, tell you, yeah, yeah. we can't imagine how immense our our human freedom is, and you know, and God's uh, going to respect that mm -hmm. uh, that freedom uh, you know, to the to right. our final days. Right. And so, um, so uh, uh, my my one thought is, I'll bet the answer lies somewhere in this whole area of free choice free, and God's judgment free. of it for us. Which is why we have so much of a responsibility since we do have the freedom to make those choices. Right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. You know, so let's talk about near-death experiences yeah. uh, in the final sure. 16, 17 minutes. Part two, yeah. we talk about it. Uh, there's something called uh, terminal lucidity you wanted to talk about. What's that about? Yeah. Well, that's another interesting validation of the fact that we have a transphysical soul. Now, the difference between uh, terminal lucidity and um, uh, you know near-death experiences is near-death experiences. There is a transition from this world, right? So the person is looking at their body, for mm -hmm. example, his or her, her body in 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 an operating room and mm -hmm. reporting what's going on, or going into the a waiting room next door and reporting what his relatives are saying or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's that part, but there's there's also part two where they go to a heavenly domain. Mm -hmm. Now these, uh, term, uh, these experiences of terminal lucidity are not that. They don't have an experience 
of that otherworldly domain, that okay. beautiful domain, that heavenly domain. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, though, it does actually show that probably our consciousness is not residing in our brain, or at least in our brain alone. Hmm. We have a transphysical, that is to say, some kind of a beyond physics, beyond physical processes, source of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And this is a really interesting set of studies, and, and it's been done on people uh, principally who have been severely mentally challenged throughout their lives, mm -hmm. people who had hydrocephalus, which is a, a considerable amount of water on the brain, but it's really spinal fluid that seeped into their cranial cavity and then has been pressurizing and, and uh, well, destroying uh, their cerebral cortex, which is their capacity to think with their organic brain, mm -hmm. or people who have severe Alzheimer's or dementia and have had it for seven or eight years. And so you can give these people an MRI mm -hmm. and you can see that their brain you know their cerebral cortex particularly and sometimes their frontal cortex has appreciably decreased mm -hmm. in size and in, in other words it's atrophied Steve, considerably right. and in addition to that uh, you, you see you know a, a, a different um, uh, sort of uh, you know um, uh, problem as, as well is, is that there are all these entanglements in Alzheimer's and things that are very easily detectable that are also causing a uh, nerve atrophy in the brain so technically these people according to the MRI are not able to think with their physical brain yet one hour to even sometimes even a week before death they wake up almost suddenly and, and the, their relatives are startled, right? Because these people will come out of this almost comatose state mm -hmm. or this vegetative state and they'll just start talking and say, well, you know, I, I gotta be arranging uh, my, my funeral arrangements here. And, and by the way, you know, my will has to be taken care of in this particular way. And I gotta tell you about all these things that have been happening. And Joe, I've heard you when you came to my hospital visits. I know you were here and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth and so on. And, you know, uh, but of course they didn't know with their physical brain now they're talking but how they're talking mm -hmm. it's not with their physical brain we have no idea mm -hmm. how they are coming to these lucid thoughts and the idea of lucidity right terminal right. lucidity mm -hmm. is all of a sudden they have this mental acuity and clarity that they never had before and so you're thinking to yourself hey wait a minute how can this happen the MRI says this person is almost brain dead and you're telling me that, that, that they're, they're, they're speaking articulately? And not only that, mm -hmm. the religious parts of these things, you know, sometimes these people come out and they're talking about religious poetry and mm -hmm. all these other kinds of things and experiences of God, and you're going, no way! You know, but the answer is way. I mean, it's really happening. And so, again, how is it happening is the question. Mm -hmm. And we've run out of answers from what we call an organic physical explanation mm -hmm. or an organic physical cause like the brain and we're kind of left with well maybe there really is mm -hmm. as near-death experiences uh, strongly suggest or even prove I would say that there really is a transphysical soul mm -hmm. and that transphysical soul uh, works through the brain but it is not um, coming from the brain itself mm -hmm. and that transphysical soul is going to survive bodily death that transphysical soul is in contact with God that transphysical soul is also very capable of, of uh, lucidity on its own mm -hmm. and when it's freed from the body it is freed from what we call the laws of physics right it's freed from gravity it's mm -hmm. freed from solidity of matter and walls etc cetera, etc cetera. so th this is a another really interesting study and uh, you know my one thought is mm -hmm. boy if you know all of the things that Pope Francis has been saying about treat people with mental disorders with the utmost respect right. and you know uh, and in all my books I have these uh, you know wh where I talk about the soul you know I really you know emphasize this because you know what you see is not what you get mm -hmm. that is what the physicalist and the empiricist would like you to believe mm -hmm. but I'm telling you right now 
that person who seems severely mentally challenged or that person who seems to be in a vegetative state, you better presume that they have a transphysical consciousness mm -hmm. which is operative and that they're somehow aware through that consciousness mm -hmm. of your presence, your love, your respect. My one thought is every human being is made with a unique transphysical soul. We have to assume it. There's just mounting evidence for this. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think the Catholic Church's teaching on this is so important. It's mm -hmm. so true, truthful. It is so civil. And it so corresponds to who the person is and their godlike eternal dignity made in the image and likeness of God himself. Right. Right. It's interesting, too, because in bringing that up, thinking in terms of uh, especially Alzheimer's patients, I, I know yeah. people over the years, including family members who had to deal with some of this. And and sometimes mm -hmm. you'd, you'd, you'd get a situation where somebody would say, well, I don't really go and visit them because they're not really there anymore. And, yeah. and your point is they are still there. Oh, yes. And, uh, you know, they may be in communion with God, mm -hmm. but do not think for a moment that they cannot appropriate and appreciate the love that you're bringing, even by your presence in the room. Mm -hmm. Even if you just come in and say, I love you very much. I think you're here present with me. I think you're also connected with the Lord right now. But I'm going to say a, a decade of the rosary here with you, or mm -hmm. I'm going to say, you know, um, your favorite five prayers with you, or mm -hmm. I'm going to read you a script passage. Mm -hmm. Don't think for a moment mm -hmm. there isn't some sort of awareness, appropriation, appreciation of the love and the faith that you're bringing into that room. It, it, it's there. You should assume it. Mm -hmm. I think the Catholic Church is being vindicated by these studies at every single second of all this that they've taught. And the Catholic Church, honestly, mm -hmm. there are some really other good uh, Protestant churches who have taught this as well are, have you know, been so countercultural against the physicalist position, against all these positions who say, uh, uh, all these positions on, on human dignity that say, oh no, intrinsic dignity is, is you know, uh, that's just a fallacy. Extrinsic dignity is the only thing that counts. Mm -hmm. All those easily displayed capabilities for articulation and intelligence and mm -hmm. physical, you know, ambulatory ability that's what really counts the extrinsic dignity mm -hmm. and of course the Catholic Church and some of these other churches have been screaming no it's intrinsic dignity they have a soul they're beloved by God they're made in the image and likeness of God treat them with respect God made them for eternity we've been the countercultural ones mm -hmm. all this time upholding the dignity of these other human beings and at and in and, and, and it's so perfect because at the end of the day, you know, um, I think we're not only being vindicated, but I think right. we have protected the culture of life right. by our countercultural preaching against physicalism and materialism. I had a story. I, I don't want to just go on and on, but I, I, there's, this story happened just yesterday mm -hmm. where this very brave young lady um, who was a friend of a, 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 a former, um, you know, a VP at the Maja Center, mm -hmm. um, her, this daughter gave birth to um, uh, a little baby um, uh, last night mm -hmm. and what happened was that um, um, the, the doctors had been telling her oh just uh, abort her because you know she's gonna live you know probably be stillborn and live only for a few minutes well she gave birth to that little baby last night that baby only lasted for 36 minutes they baptized that baby they expressed their love for that baby and of course this is gonna make all the difference in the world to that baby in mm -hmm. you know uh, in his soul or, or in her soul right. and, and of course at the same time to all the people who are there present who maintain that faith but what a testimony to intrinsic dignity right. from the vantage point of extrinsic dignity in the world ah, this is just you know this is just crazy stuff you know why are you bothering but from the eyes of faith and the viewpoint right. of intrinsic dignity which should be the only thing that we think about day and night mm -hmm. right you know is and and right. that 
really testifies. That's real courage and that's a real example. And the Lord will repay them a billion times told lovelier for this. Right. And that my, my one thought is, keep it up everybody. This right. is the kind of heroic witness to intrinsic dignity right. through the eyes well, of if, faith that's right. going to rescue our culture. So well, if you, you, you cast out intrinsic dignity, it becomes utilitarianism and then you end up in a situation yeah. like the Nazis or the commie where you get rid of Absolutely. the handicap and get rid of anybody who's not supporting the good of, of yeah. the state, so to speak, basically. Oh, yeah. We've got this assisted suicide movement going on full blast right now. Right. And it's all about extrinsic dignity. I mean, you know, people look at the Catholic Church, you know, and they're thinking to themselves, well, what, are you, what are you trying to tell me, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, people's lives, you know, who are, I mean, they've lost their ambulatory ability. I mean, surely you can't think that that's dignified. Mm -hmm. Well, from the vantage point of, an ex of external dignity, maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe that person is has Alzheimer's disease and is really having difficulty. Maybe from the vantage point of extrinsic dignity, they don't have, uh, you know, much either in the comparative mode mm -hmm. of this materialistic culture. However, in the vantage point of Jesus and in the vantage point of, you know, you know, the transphysical soul that we're getting mm -hmm. all kinds of validation of, that person has the same intrinsic dignity as you and me, which is immense because we're made in the image and likeness of God. We're uniquely made, uniquely made in the image of God as uniquely good and lovable and transcendent. And, and if you look at that and you look at that teaching, then that person deserves to be treated with respect. And, and of course, the, it's not just the whole thing of, you know, manipulating people into committing suicide, which nobody, you know, bothers mm. to talk about. Mm -hmm. But l l when you give people this option, mm -hmm. you know, what you're doing is you're opening the door to crass manipulation and implicit manipulation mm -hmm. toward assisted suicide, but it's all based on extrinsic materialistic dignity instead of intrinsic dignity. A Catholic Church is the one real defender of this, and, well, and other churches, as I said, mm -hmm. who have are, are also on board, but but we have been so countercultural, and mm -hmm. we're being vindicated at every moment. And God bless the courageous testimony of the people who constantly bring this out. It'll save us from the culture of death if we can be validated and if we keep up courageously giving testimony. Well, to one them. one of the things too that struck me in, in listening to your discussion about the terminal lucidity, etc., is is maybe the comfort it gives to so many caregivers and family members who maybe yeah. in the final days did what they could and always felt like well maybe mom or dad didn't realize or I wish they knew how much I was I was trying to do for them and and, and the idea that they do mm -hmm. oh yeah I mean there are so many great um, testimonies too uh, about people, um, you know, there was a, a, a fellow professor at, at Georgetown University, uh, you know, who was teaching with me. This is a while back, but he he gave a testimony about how he was working in a um, an Alzheimer's uh, home, you know, and uh, um, you know this one fellow who was a former professor, uh, very esteemed economics professor, I believe, at uh, at Georgetown University. Uh, this fellow um, didn't want to play pin the tail on the donkey, you know, he, he, and so the nurses came and said, well, this one is a very stubborn one and he's angry and he doesn't want to play pin the tail on the donkey. So, of course, this fellow who was a, a really great psychiatrist, mm -hmm. he, he basically started probing the guy who had very little verbal capacity, right? Took the guy five minutes just to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. But the main thing was is he finally got out of him that he still had that sense of dignity of being a professor. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know, I'm going to put together 20 questions on a study about Alzheimer's. I want to know what's going on inside of you. And so he waited patiently mm -hmm. for the patient, you know, five minutes minutes later, yes, five minutes later, no, right? He waited patiently for the answer to these 20 questions. And then he had the dean of, this, uh, of the College of Arts and Sciences at Georgetown put together a little plaque for this guy mm -hmm. saying, you know, Dr. So-and-so, you've made so much difference to the study of Alzheimer's, et cetera, signed, you know, the mm -hmm. dean of the school at, at uh, Georgetown University. And so he read this plaque to this fellow who had almost no mm -hmm. verbal capacity to express his thoughts. The minute he finished it, he said, signed by, you know, da-da-da-da, this guy broke out in tears. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, he understood immediately mm -hmm. what was going on. Mm -hmm. So we even have this kind of testimony as well, mm -hmm. that there is something clearly going on with people who are in an Alzheimer's position, they, and they still remember their prayers. They still remember so many emotive conditions. They're, they're tuned into the emotive conditions of other people. Even though they may not have a lot of memory or intellectual capacity, mm -hmm. they are tuned into religion, tuned into the emotional uh, you know, dimensions of people, right. etc. And of course, this guy just crying, it meant so much to him. You know, he hugged the thing. Mm -hmm. you know the the the, the plaque right. and so you know you know this this is not killing the soul right yes there is this severe atrophying going on in the body and the brain but no we we are made in the image and likeness of god right. and our soul is present and so yes you know the catholic church is teaching once again vindicated right. countercultural that it though it may be let me ask you, as we're wrapping out here, uh, every year uh, you have an event that uh, the Napa Institute puts on that you're central mm -hmm. to. You want to give us a quick pitch on it? It's coming up in a couple of oh, weeks. That's right. Uh, this is uh, going to be in uh, Napa, California. I believe it's starting on uh, the 13th of July, and it's at a, a place called the Meritage Resort. Anyway, um, there's going to be a, a Cardinal uh, a Muller uh, is going wow. to be okay. there. Uh, I mean, a very uh, big uh, a fellow, you know, uh, and of course, you know, Catherine Pakalik is, is going to be there. A variety of other uh, really excellent theologians are, are going to be there as, as well. Uh, Mary Hassan will be mm -hmm. there, and of course, uh, uh, yours truly will be there. Of course. Uh, among many, many speakers. <laughs> and if you just go to, I believe it's uh, Napa Institute. Uh, um, uh, dot org. If you just go to that website, you can see the entire group of speakers. But it's not just the speakers; it's meeting all these very good folks. Right? There's about 600 people there. Mm -hmm. uh, there there's a, just every kind of uh, liturgy imaginable that is being offered there. Eucharistic processions, retreats that go on as well during uh, the day and and before the, right. the the institute actually begins. So it is really a, a compounded, uh, you know, Catholic religious right. experience uh, at, that I think might be very, very worthwhile to those who many who have uh, uh, the time uh, to 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 okay. to, uh, to go there. That's terrific. And with that being said, let's have a quick blessing as we head out of the show, Father. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may Almighty God send His Holy Spirit down upon you to inspire you and guide you, that you might truly know the beautiful destiny for which He has prepared for you from the beginning of time in your unique goodness, lovability, and transcendence with Him. And may you be faithful and attempt to stay on the road calling upon his mercy so that at the end of your life you may be with him in paradise and with the blessed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Excellent. Thank you so much, Father. Uh, we shall see you next week. We have a replay next week, but uh, two weeks we'll be talking more about uh, the Bible and the science and evolution and wrap things up as always. Thank you, Father Spitzer, and thank you all for joining us here. Don't forget about the Napa Institute Conference Father mentioned, of course, and don't forget all about the wonderful program we, we have here on EW10 each week again. Next time, evolution, the Bible, and science. We can deal with it all right here in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe where faith and reason meet and understand each other. We'll see you next time.